What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Nourish with Renata podcast. Today, I am so excited to be able to share with you someone that I recently met and we totally hit it off because we both believe really powerfully in the healing power of food and how overcoming some of our own health and eating challenges can truly pave the way, not only for ourselves in terms of our health and happiness, but also in terms of what we choose to do and how we choose to serve others moving forward as well. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Maddie. How's it going? Hi, it's going well. It's better now that I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Yay. So Maddie, I'd love for you to share a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Yeah. Well, hi, my name is Maddie. Um, I'm from West Hollywood, but I'm a Texas girl. I came to Texas real early um, in life. Thank goodness. And (laughs) um, I'm back in Texas again after a while. Um, I am a holistic personal trainer. Uh, So basically very mind, body, spirit, personal trainer. Um, I also lead group classes. I really enjoy yoga, meditation, as well as weight and resistance training. And I really love looking at those two worlds and kind of seeing where they overlap because I believe that anything, anything like regarding your body or your health comes down to looking at the whole picture. So I'm a personal trainer who likes to look at the whole picture, not just the end result. So that's kind of what I guess I, I stand for with that. I love it. So we connected over Instagram and I'm going to link all of Maddie's Instagrams below so that everyone can connect with her because she's an amazing trainer. And one of the reasons why we connected so powerfully was because we had both seen how incredible food can affect our body and our health. And specifically for you, Maddie, we talked a little bit about your journey and your journey through healing from an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So as much as you feel comfortable sharing, I'd love for you to talk about that because I think it's going to resonate with so many women. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I'm super open about my story um, and it is, it's kind of a long one. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to put it in as few words as I can, you know, and sum it up. But yeah, I have had a really interesting relationship with food from a very young age. Um, As many women who struggle with eating issues do. I think that mine kind of started around 14, um, which is wild now to to think about a 14 year old struggling with food issues. Right. Um, I, yeah, I had a, my mother was struggling with addiction at that point. Um, so she was really hitting up the McDonald's for us a lot. And, um, you know, at this point now though, you know, she's nine years sober, she's doing amazing. So that's great news. But, um, at that time, you know, I didn't have anyone showing me the ropes and I didn't play any sports. Um, I remember growing up going to PE and we had to run the mile every year and hiding in the bathroom and just like being so scared to, um, be tested in any way physically, which is just so ironic. Um, And yeah, so, and on the other end, my father, he is a musician and he's done very well for himself. So his image is super important. So I kind of had this interesting mix of not getting the support that I needed, but also having the pressure from the other parent, which was like a very difficult combination for me as a teenager. And that just kind of manifested itself in different ways over time. Um, And ultimately, what I found is that it got worse in times that I felt like I had very little control. It was very much a control mechanism. I felt like if I was thin enough or pretty enough that I was going to get different opportunities. I was going to be invited to the right things. And, and that very much carried over into adulthood. 
Um, and that was really the bottom line that I believe did carry into adulthood so much and, you know, is still very much, you know, I, I say I, I'm, I'm in recovery for this. I, I don't say that I'm healed because it's one of those things that is not linear. Um, but I do believe that I've made amazing progress and I got, you know, I did ultimately end up getting help for it. So I'm really grateful for for this last year and that, that period of time um, where I got that help. Yeah. So obviously this was something that continued for many years. Mm-hmm. And I would venture to guess that it wasn't necessarily something that you were aware of the whole time. It was probably, you know, at a deep subconscious level that these things were occurring. So at what point did it become conscious to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you said that, Renata, because that was a thought that I had before I I came and I was kind of reflecting and I was like, wow. So at the time that this actually got like hit its peak and I had become the most unhealthy I had been, I wasn't even aware that it was I was had an eating issue. I, I really felt like I had a you know, more of a depression, anxiety issue. Um, and I didn't realize that I, the first thing I was using to, to remedy that was, you know, the abstaining from eating and, um, yeah, basically using that as a tool. Cause it was a tool that I had known for the longest, right. Mm. Um, it was a go-to. So, um, in terms of your question, uh, when I, when I real, so your question was when I realized that I, that I, can you repeat your question? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So when did you realize you had something a little bit different going on that maybe wasn't healthy for you anymore? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I was living down in Guatemala at the time. I had lived down there at that point for about two and a half years. Um, and I had basically entered into one of the deepest depressions I'd ever experienced. And it was very surprising because my most of my time there, I was truly living the dream and so happy around a very healthy, like-minded community. And um, I was very surprised, right? My cat is really trying to get in our podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, to be honest, even as it was happening, I had no idea. It wasn't until after the fact. So I look back at pictures now and I'm like, whoa, I mean, I was about 112 pounds. I was five foot five. All of the years of working out, all the muscle was gone. I was tiny and I had no idea. So my mom noticed, my friends noticed. Um, I I had friends that, you know, weren't close friends that had avoided me, you know, it was very obvious that I wasn't doing well. And I had no idea. (laughs) I had no idea. I thought that it was, it was great news that I was thin. you know, I didn't think that that would ever be a reason why, you know, I would be struggling to maintain friendships and things like that. Also, I was exhausted. I was sleeping all of the time. Couldn't focus. Um, I, I had trouble with sleep you know, all of that. So eventually, you know, it it just, it got to the point where I was like, I need help with all of the emotional um, tolls that were coming through on that end. Um, And yeah, so basically my mom orchestrated everything. She kind of knew what to do. And um, I basically just one day it all happened really fast I just got on a plane and kind of just felt like I woke up in this crazy strange place and I was in Costa Rica uh suddenly the doors were locked around me and I had been this free bird for the past three years and I was terrified I was I was so scared. I was surrounded by people who had a range of different things. And I didn't think we had so much in common, but I I did find out later that, you know, we have, we had a lot in common and 
um, that need for control and that need for, um, I guess, feeling like you are getting closer to this like perfect version of yourself um, can manifest itself in so many different ways. So I found myself in the perfect place. Um, and I actually ended up going through a 12 step program, but more so for this eating stuff, this control stuff, it was very much needed to be a holistic life conversation. It couldn't just be this conversation about how do you need to eat? You know, and that's what so many people had approached me with originally with, hey, you need to eat and hey, make sure, you know, rather than how are you asking these questions um, that I feel like were, were just not coming, coming up because people, you know, naturally we don't, we don't know what to do when we see someone struggling with that. So, yeah. So I actually ended up asking for help, which I believe is one of the bravest things I've done in my life. Um, and I always say that, um, and I stayed there for a hundred days. Um, I actually only needed to stay for 30, but I chose to stay longer. And, um, honestly, after that, everything changed for me. Um, I'm in a very different place and I decided to drop my career. You know, obviously I still, still love marketing and I still love digital advertising, but I realized that, that I had a voice on this topic that really needed to be heard. Um, and I decided to go full-time into personal training, um, and just help other men and women, um, both just with feeling good in their body, good in their skin. So that was where that decision came forward. And, um, I, I'm very much, very much confident that it was the right one. I mean, everything's been going so perfectly since then. So, yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So what I felt was really interesting about your story was number one, how you said at the time, you didn't really notice that anything was quote unquote wrong. And yet so many people around you did. So I mm -hmm. want to just say, sometimes we don't even notice what's happening to ourselves. We really need that outside perspective mm -hmm. to be able to come to us in love and say like, Hey, I think you might need help. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious because it was your mom that orchestrated everything was, do you think she was aware of what was going on with you? Because she herself had had those addiction problems in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was very blessed at that point um, to have a mother who understood um, what I needed and and what to do. And she didn't panic. You know, mm -hmm. I think one of the best things she did for me was she stayed and I get goosebumps talking about it, but she stayed so calm throughout the whole process. And she was like, OK, baby, don't worry. And um, I got this flight booked for you. And um, she, you know, she wasn't there. I can't even imagine how terrifying it must have been to um, being a mother and your daughter being down in, in a country like Guatemala, which is a beautiful country, but also, you know, it's far away. Um, you don't have the same resources. So she just handled that situation with such grace. Um, and the approach that I really needed was nurturing. I really needed compassion and patience. And um, rather than, you know, get it together, which, you know, was more of my father's response, to be honest. Um, so it's interesting to, you know, get both, you know, everyone reacts differently. Uh, but in terms of that, uh, yeah. And it was really important too, I will say, to almost get support from someone third party. As much as the conversations with the therapist I've been working with since I was 14 were helpful, you know, she was kind of part of our family at that point. And my grandmother and my best friend and my mom, um, I needed to talk to a stranger. <laughs> mm. 
um, yeah. actually to really feel and believe that I was getting this objective, professional kind of opinion. Um, so it's so wild because we don't want to seek help from a stranger with our most vulnerable things, but that was actually what I what I needed at that mm. point. So yeah. Wow. That's such a great awareness because I think that usually it's more difficult to talk to the people closest to you about these things that are really happening deep inside. And that leads me to the second theme that I noticed about your share, which was that food was really, or your relationship with food was really a symptom of something else going on. Like there was a deeper root cause underlying that. And that's what you really needed when you went into the facility to be able to have conversations around what's actually going on under the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, it was a, it was a huge control thing. Um, Like I said, you know, having control over people's kind of responses and reactions to me um, opportunities I had you know, I got into modeling at that time too. And I was feeling the pressures from, from that. Um, and even just, yeah, but, you know, I also really like to, yeah, I, I, I was experiencing anxiety and depression, but now I've learned also as well. Like, I don't say anymore, I have anxiety or I have depression, but I, I say that I, I experienced that and I, and I still do sometimes, you know? Um, so those were the underlying causes, but what I didn't realize and what I've learned so much now, as I've become a personal trainer and I've started to meet people like you who have educated me so much is, um, the, the ways that you can support this journey through, um, m- supporting your serotonin, lowering your cortisol, you know, and there's all of these ways. And I was actually really underestimating the damage I was doing because it wasn't a matter of not eating enough calories or not. It was, it was the fact of when I would eat also what I was eating, there was no nutritional value. So my body wasn't able to operate. I wasn't able to think properly which is another reason why I have issues with things like Ozempic and all of this stuff that's going on right now, because I just do not believe that anyone can function without food at the end of the day, um, even if it works on the outside. So I will speak now because I didn't even know because you go so long eating a certain way, you think that you're always going to struggle with brain fog and you think you're always going to struggle with, um, I mean, that was a big one for me, memory issues, for instance. Um, And you think that's like a part of your personality in a way. And then you start paying attention to those things, particularly with diet, because I I really didn't pursue medications um, this route. It was really, my medications were my diet. I was eating this holistic Costa Rican diet. And um, that was when I realized, oh my gosh, I'm remembering all of these details. I have this energy throughout the day because not having energy is depressing. (laughs) You know, it's also anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. Um, So maintaining your body is giving you a chance at combating your circumstances. Um, because ultimately that's your front line. It's, it's your body, what you can physically do. Um, so that was a big part of what I had found in that process. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I always love to talk about that healing power of food, because, you know, it literally helps our DNA to be expressed. Right. I know. I know. It's crazy. Truly incredible. So you obviously went through a transformational experience. And like you said, everything since then has been a complete 180. So I'd love for you to share about why you then decided to move from obviously marketing into a holistic approach to personal training and why that speaks so loudly to your own personal mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So 
interestingly enough, you know, marketing, it, it's, it's very similar to the fitness industry in a lot of ways, or it looks really pretty on the surface. And that's our jobs to make everything look really pretty on the surface, but we're not paying attention or attending to the things that are operating. And so marketing can be very similar to say bodybuilding or, you know, whatever you may in that way where, um, we're making everything look really nice. And I jumped into the fitness industry expecting I was going to run into all of these like-minded individuals and found um, out very quickly that that is not the case, that there are a lot, there were a lot of dangers for me. Um, someone who was at the point very early in her journey in the fitness industry and <laughs> in the health industry, right? I started working at a bodybuilder gym um, and the way I was watching these people kind of eating and um, if it meets your macros kind of mentality and, uh, you know, a plethora of things that come with, you know, the extremists, right? Which really have our ideal bodies. Um, and just all of the stress and anxiety I was, I was viewing and, and watching these coaches, um, experience backstage, you know, at the gym, not, not tending to things in their personal life, not, um, really holding space for themselves in terms of balance and, I ended up just very quickly realizing that, you know, it was a dangerous place and also not something I resonated with and not a place that I wanted um, to, to be supporting other people. And so I realized how important um, a holistic approach would be. And holistic is obviously, you know, everyone has a very different view of what that word means, right? You know, there's a very woo woo side of that word. And then there's like, you know, a very scientific kind of practical side of that word. Um, so I'm sure I dabble in both a little, you know, a little bit, I, I really value science. And then I also really value some of the things that we can't see and feelings and intuitions. And um, so I, wanted to bring a space for my clients where nothing was off the table. Nothing was out of my, I mean, there's plenty of things that are out of my scope, but there's nothing that I'm not down to chat about. You know, there's not anything that I'm not down to point you to, you know, another professional who can support you. Like, just talk to me, tell me about yourself, not just, you know, how much weight you can, you can pull. So, um, at that point, you know, I found that I had a lot of success with my clients straight out the gate um, of all ages from, you know, in their 20s all the way to in their 70s. I found that everyone really um, this first round of clients that I had uh, upon entering the industry, most of them are still my clients. You know, we've stuck together and the results that we have had, I, uh, I don't think either of us anticipated. So, um, whatever it is, it's working. And really what it comes down to, I think is that, you know, it's, there's nothing too personal at that point. Um, it's worth talking about everything, looking at the whole picture, uh, and, and, you know, my biggest advice for someone going into this, um, seeking support with their body in any way is to be very picky and, and to be working with someone who is, who is open, you know, to having difficult conversations with you, being real with you, um, and isn't focusing so, so much on the aesthetics as much as they are on the journey and the love that you need to have for yourself, like right at the beginning of that journey, um, not just the love you're going to have for yourself at the end Does this motivational factor. It's, I believe that the only way you're going to get there is if you genuinely love who you are on day one, you know, so that's a little bit about my 
strategy <laughs> or yeah, whatever. your philosophy my yeah. philosophy yeah yeah and I think that's yeah. why we get along so well because we believe the same thing so yeah. one of my tenants for my nutrition coaching number one is self-love because yep. without that no amount of weight loss inches loss etc cetera, etc cetera, is going to create that for you it's really key to create that and to build that muscle mm -hmm. right at the beginning of your journey yep yep Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I, I resonated with what you were doing immediately. Um, I can tell that you are kind of here for your clients on a personal level. And obviously, you know, you do have to protect your time as a professional. It's like, it's not like you're a therapist, you're not trying to go over the scope, but you, you probably noticed as well um, through years of what you've been doing that food is, is very personal. Um, it's something that we use to connect with others, especially living abroad in Central America too. I learned it's, it's very cultural. It's very important. Um, you go somewhere, someone cooks you something, you don't eat it. It's considered very culturally inappropriate and rude. And, and, and there's reasons for that, that, that shows that food is, is so much more than this caloric value, keep you alive thing. Um, so it is, it's also how we express ourselves. And I also believe food is an artistic medium. And I'm not saying that because I'm the best cook in the world because I'm definitely not, but, um, I think that there's a lot of ways that we express ourselves with what we choose to eat too. So I don't even take it that far. Yeah, completely agree. So I'm really curious, what kind of things are you doing on a daily basis to help you to continue to foster a positive relationship with food now? Mm, mm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of a little things, you know. Um, Self-talk is huge. Uh, recognizing when I'm not being kind to myself no matter what decision I made with the food uh, and, and pausing has been huge. Uh, usually I like to do guided meditations uh, or move my body in some way, which I believe is also a meditative practice, helps me line that out. Um, I believe on those tough days, it's important to stay away from social media uh, social media has a lot of amazing things. I, I love social media, you know, as a tool, but when you're in a vulnerable state, you need to protect yourself. You need to cross your T's and dot your I's, stay away from any strong forces of energy because you're already a strong force of energy. So, I think I try to make these moments that I'm not being gentle with myself very sacred because we're not trying to put them away. Um, it's really important that I lean into them and understand what, you know, my body, my mind is, is trying to tell me. Maybe there's something that's imbalanced. Maybe there's something that I, you know, need to... I need to be doing for myself. Um, so it's really been a matter of recognizing those. And then also I've mentioned this before, it's really capitalizing on the good moments. Um, so, you know, one of the things I like to do whenever I am having a really amazing moment, you know, like you just nailed something, you just got that opportunity you've been trying to get for so long. Um, or you're just like in a really good mood. And I will voice record myself um, talking about where I'm at, like how I feel about what I'm capable of, you know, what I believe is true and possible for my future. And I actually have this viable, you know, voice recording that I can listen to and I can allow this like, you know, more fragile version of myself, which is so important and so valid to have a conversation with this stronger version of myself. So I try to connect those two girls, you know, and um, remind them that both are there, 
they're both necessary and valid um, and kind of like send messages to each other. So that's like a little tactic or technique I like to do um, to kind of work on the way I'm speaking to myself. But I think that that kind of covers, you know, I guess the bottom line is that you're gonna have both, you know, and you have to know how to speak with and work with both versions of yourself, you know. That I've never heard that tip before. And I agree, <laughs> it is so powerful because you're utilizing, like you said, you're capitalizing on that moment where you're feeling incredibly high energy, high vibe, positivity, strength, yeah. confidence, etc. And you're yeah. saving a part of that energy for you when inevitably you might not be feeling the same way and I think self-talk is a practice so being able to go back and listen to that constantly every day or whenever you have those rougher days I mean that is going to rewire those neural pathways in your brain so much faster because it's you speaking to you you it's literally you yeah yeah wow. absolutely. absolutely I'm definitely stealing that idea because it's so <laughs> wonderful it. I love it <laughs> not the word yeah. <laughs> absolutely oh, thank absolutely. you for sharing that I have one yeah. more question for you I just feel like this has been such an inspirational episode and I'm really excited for everyone to connect with you so I want to remind everyone to go into the description box and make sure they connect with you but my last question for you is for any woman that might be listening or man that might be listening and have resonated with this idea that, you know, maybe my body's not operating well right now. Maybe all of that brain fog, maybe that depression and anxiety that I'm experiencing isn't how I need to live the rest of my life. What words of wisdom would you say to them to help them to work through this low point that they're experiencing right now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I would probably remind them very, you know, similar to kind of what I just said is that this low point that you're in is so necessary and valid and has a lot to teach you that you're going to need to get to the other side and maintain that sense of inner peace, which will always try to elude you because life gets complicated. So all of the things they, I mean, a lot of people talk about shadow work, for instance, which is all about like leaning into the things that you don't necessarily love about yourself. Um, and, and I really believe in this work because I, I believe sometimes it's easier to understand things about ourselves when we're in a state of vulnerability and fragility than it is whenever we're actually happy and in a great mood, you know, so understand that this is a valuable time as well. This is, this is step one, um, this you're already on your journey it's already begun you know that that recognition that you're having is a breakthrough and congratulations and I'm so proud of you you know um and at that point you know we're we're only gonna go up baby you know because now we know what we're dealing with so um yeah definitely acknowledge it as a piece of your journey this piece and um write it down you know like really I wish that I would have uh documented more um and and get to know that that piece of you and then also you know the second piece of that is is it's it's not always gonna be like this because you just made this realization and now it's inevitable for you to be pulling yourself into the next chapter of your life because that recognition was all you needed so um get excited about the future um you know start envisioning it writing about it talking about it voice recording about it um and also like I said at the beginning here, do not be afraid to ask for help. And that help may not always be your best friend or your mom or your husband. Um, it's, it's likely it won't. Um, 
be open because there's people that are experiencing what you are that you never would have given a chance. So whenever we're in these moments of fear of vulnerability, it allows us to open ourselves up more than we typically would. And you'll probably walk away with a web of people who are there to support you that you never would have had before um, had you never experienced this feeling of self-doubt and frustration or depression or whatever that looks like for you. So um, be very open to the help around you. I do believe that there is a plan and and kind of a design uh, at this point in our lives. So, yeah. It's a mouthful, but (laughs) (laughs) I think that was so motivational and so encouraging. And I love how you really highlighted that those low low points that we all feel at one point or another, they're necessary and they're valid. And I think that's such a beautiful reminder that, you know, you're already on the journey. You don't need to start. You're already there. And it's all, it's all going to be awesome because we've recognized that low point now and we keep moving. We keep moving. Yep. Just keep swimming. <laughs> <laughs> we all know it. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <set> it first. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for sharing your story and your wisdom. I mean, I have taken away so many golden nuggets from this and I just can't wait to implement them because you've really inspired me to continue to look for more ways to speak to my, speak to myself, to, to improve that self-talk to be kinder to myself and to continue to work on that relationship, that self-love every single day, because that is really the, that's the root of all things. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And I'm still on that journey too. No one's got it all figured out. Um, And I'm so grateful to be here. And, you know, if anyone is listening that ever has any questions for me, like I am, an open book and you know all you got to do is, is is reach out dm me something simple and and i'm so here for i'm so here to sit down and have those conversations with anyone you know who is here at that place because i needed that so bad you know so i'm so grateful to to be here to share my story thank you so much renata for the the opportunity and the platform you're welcome i want to make sure that people connect with you so your instagram handle yeah, so it's at Maddie Lou Fit. So Maddie M A D D Y L E W F I T. Maddie Lou Fit. Yes, Maddie. and I know that <laughs> I know that you also have awesome programs. You work both locally and virtually, which is wonderful for people who really want to bring that holistic approach to training to their homes or to the gym if they happen to be local too. So I just want to shout you out for that because that is a wonderful service you're providing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Either way, if you just have a yoga mat or you live in Mexico, you know, I can work with you. If you're in in my town, you live next door to me, you know, we can work together. It doesn't matter. We'll we'll have an amazing time together. So yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So good. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening and watching this episode. Make sure to share it out on your social media, share it with someone that you love, especially tell them anything that you took away as the most meaningful from this episode. And we will see you in the next episode of the Nourish with Renata podcast.